Welcome to another episode of InRange. As you may see behind me, everything is very green and lush. And we've gone from exceptionally dry and hot here in Arizona to exceptionally hot and humid here in Arizona. And one of the things that popped in my mind was something I really haven't talked about, but I've seen a lot of comments about it, which is how would a percussion revolver, such as this 1860 Colt, work in a rain environment? In other words, how good are these pre-cartridge guns in dealing with bad weather? Well, I'm gonna go ahead and say and postulate that the reality of the switch from the flintlock to the percussion ignition system was a huge leap forward in that regard. But there's other things that play into that as well. So here what we have on the table is a flintlock naval single shot pistol, smooth bore. We have two 1860 Colts and we have a star single action percussion revolver. And so I can't call the rain down on command here in Arizona, but what I can do is bring out a water jug and so I'm going to load each and every one of these pistols. We're going to fire it to make sure that it works properly here on video. Then we're going to introduce simulated rain since we can't call the rain on by demand. And we're gonna see how each and every one of these pistols actually works in a bad weather environment. There's a lot that plays into this and I'm gonna go through a little bit of that when I show you how to load each and every one of these. So we're gonna talk about why the loading and how they load and how the projectiles work play into the idea that a percussion revolver is actually far more reliable in the rain than you ever would have thought. So besides the fact that it's a smooth bore and therefore not as accurate and it's a single shot, the biggest deficiency with the flintlock or the flintlock priming system was its susceptibility to water ingress. Because as you can see, once you put priming in here, which is just black powder and close this frizzen, there's a gap here. And in the rain, water will get in here contaminate your priming charge, and then it won't go off. Now, a properly tuned flintlock is actually very reliable, but this water issue is huge, and that's where the percussion cap changed things dramatically. So I'm gonna show you how to load this, and then we will show this in the rain uh, as a precursor to going through the percussion revolvers. So in this regard, of course, make sure that you're cleared and empty. I'm gonna go ahead and just close the prison right now because I don't want powder to fall out. And I'm gonna throw a double powder charge just because that's the sort of powder that I have right here right now. So powder, powder, and then a somewhat undersized ball because that's how smooth bores worked. As you can see it sort of falls down there already, but we'll go ahead and seat it just to make sure it's all the way in. And then this is called tow. It's essentially plant material. And you have to put this in there because the undersized ball will otherwise literally roll right out. This is what keeps the projectile seated on the powder charge. Once you've done all that, when you're ready to actually prime the gun, you would open this, you would pour powder here, and then close it. And at that point, you would then go to full cock and that's how you'd fire. But as we're gonna see in the test, I highly doubt that this is going to make it when water gets in through this gap and therefore contaminates the priming charge. So we've got a couple different percussion revolvers here, and what I'm gonna do is talk about the loading procedure and how to do that properly, historically speaking, because that's what we wanna to test today is the historical way of loading these guns in the rain. So in that regard, the most important thing you can do is make sure that the projectile you're using is properly sized for your chamber. So I think one of the problems that we have with a lot of modern people shooting these guns is they use undersized projectiles, like for example, 0.451 or something like that. Uh, of course, it matters based on your gun, but for these 44s, I tend to go oversized, and this is a 0.457. And the reason for that is that when you load them, you get these rings of lead that shear off, and that means you have a properly sealed chamber. And that's very important, of course, not only for accuracy, uh, to prevent chain fires where more than one chamber goes off at once, but also, in theory, to prevent rain from getting into the powder charge and therefore disabling the gun in bad weather. So I've already loaded a bunch of chambers on this one, but we're gonna go ahead and load two so you can see the process. So one, you just use this flask and you make sure there's a powder in that there, and you fill the chamber. And you simply take a ball, and in historical times, people did not use a wad. That is a more modern invention. They literally just put the round ball or the projectile in, which wasn't always round ball, and then you just ram it home. And with a tight-fitting projectile, you will see, hopefully, let me see, oh, there it is. There's that ring that I said would shear off, and that means you have a properly sealed chamber. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that to the next chamber. 
Let's go back around. Power charge. And again, they didn't use wads. That's a more modern thing. Round ball. And then seat. And once again, see if I can catch it. Here's that ring, once again proving that we've sealed that chamber properly. We've got one more chamber to do. And once again, that ring. Now, this is loading per Colt's instructions. No wad. Now, some people might put lubricant, even back in the day, they would put some sort of lubricant over this to help deal with the fouling, but even that wasn't part of Colt's original instructions. Their instructions were powder, ball, percussion cap. So the next most important thing you can do to ensure that your gun is protected against the elements when you're using a percussion revolver is that the percussion cap it properly fits the cone and nip or nipple of your cylinder. So in this regard, I have aftermarket cones on this that are all properly sized to specifically fit Remington number 10 percussion caps. Now, I have a Polish cap here, which I've modified to work well. Kind of. There it is. Actually, I just dumped one out, so that's fine. So here's a percussion cap. This is a Remington number 10, and these cones are specifically sized to number 10. And when you place it on there, it is a good, tight fit. That's important for more than one reason. One, it won't fall off during the firing cycle, which will prevent or help reduce cap jams. But secondarily, it seals this from the elements. So at this point, this chamber is sealed from the rear on the cone with a properly fitted percussion cap. In theory, sealed from the front because the oversized projectile sheared off a ring, meaning this is really airtight, essentially. So water in here should not get to the powder charge, either from the rear or from the front. I also realize people are going to ask about the star because it's such an unusual gun. So really, because we want to use the loading lever that's part of the revolver, I'm going to go ahead and put the cylinder back in. But other than that, the procedure is honestly identical. So we have this at half cock. Cylinder will spin freely. Powder charge. Once again, 0.457 oversized projectile. And then just ram it home. And same thing happens, whether it's the Colt or the Star. Here is our lead ring shaved off to prove that we properly sealed the chamber. No different on the star than a Colt. You can still cap with the cylinder in the revolver. I personally find that it's easier to take the screw out and just cap it by hand and then put it back in, but that's really just personal choice. All right, we're out here and it has rained horrifically last night. In fact, it was very hard to get out here, but we're gonna start with our control, which is the flintlock. Without water, no rain yet on this. We're just gonna prime the pan and we're gonna fire just to prove that it's working and then we will reload and do the same thing after watering it. So here's our control. As you can see, that worked just fine. So single shot goodness, let me go reload, and then we're gonna get the water treatment. Okay, I've already reloaded. Open the frizzen, let me prime the pan. And now we're going to give it the water treatment. How do we do that? with this. Can't call on the rain, happens when it wants to, but this will do it on demand. Let's see here. Got a little better. There we go. Oh yeah, it's raining hard. It's really raining on this flintlock. Alright, let's see. This works. That'll be impressive. Are you ready? As expected. Let me re. Ugh. The black powder in there is like mud. So let's clear it out. Oh, there's water running down the pan into the action. 
go ahead and reprime it, see if we get anything. I'm surprised we got a puff at all, to be honest. All right, so clean, clean powder for priming. Let's see if that works. No, this thing's done. A little bit of rain, flintlock's over with. Let's move on to the percussion guns. All right, people knew that these were still susceptible to the weather and they wanted to protect these expensive guns at the time. So in the 1860s, 1870s, maybe even the 1880s, you would be using a holster like this, a flap holster, which you can see really protects the gun from the elements very well. But we're not testing the holster today. But here we have the ubiquitous 1860 Colt, the most common percussion revolver ever. So let's go ahead and fire the first round just to prove that she's working. And we're going to give her the same rain treatment we just gave the flintlock. Here we go. Now, this is real conditions here, right? The rain down on it. Let's see what happens. Shake some of that water off. Not that time. What about this one? Third shot fired. And we are having some issues, but obviously we're still firing. Nope. 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 Well, not as good as I expected. Uh, I thought we would get through at least the entire cylinder. We did not. Better than the flintlock, but still a real challenge in the rain. So let's go get the star revolver. Probably be the same effect, but let's give it a try. This is the single action star revolver, the second or third most issued percussion revolver of the Civil War. Uh, I think it's a really great weapon. It does have some little idiosyncrasies like the grip's a little strange and such. But the ability to take the screw out and break it open to not only reload but clean is a wonderful function. Will this do better than the Colt in the rain? I don't know, the function's about the same. But let's fire the first shot. As expected. All right, here comes the rain again. This is not drizzle, right? This is pretty bad. All right. Shake some of that off. Second shot. Hey! Third? Fourth? Getting splattered with water. We got two more rounds. Let's give it some more rain treatment. I am angling the gun down a little bit so the water's not going down into the chamber. Perhaps that's the difference. We'll do a third round and see what happens. Here we go. Fifth. And the sixth. Ah. Finally didn't get it to go on the sixth. Let's go ahead and cycle around. Let's give that another hit. Nope. All right. So the star did better, but that might have just been odds and luck. I'm going to go clean up the Colt. I'm going to reload it and see if we can get through five instead of just what happened there. Um, but I'm actually kind of surprised. I expected these to do a little better than they did. I thought these would seal a little more. Let's see what happens here. No, not going to happen. Let's go back to the Colt. Okay, we're completely reloaded. This time, however, I did load with a wad between the powder charge and the projectile. I said earlier in the video that his... Historically speaking, that was not what was done, and I proved it by showing original Colt documentation with the 1851, just saying pour powder and seat ball. I have found reproduction copies of later Colt How to Load Your Colt stickers that were on the box with the gun that says to powder, wad, ball. At the same time, if you research this online, you'll find that people talk about not ever seeing wads being used until the 1900s or like 1940s even. I don't know about the historicity of putting a wad or patching between the powder and the ball. And that documentation that I found, air quote, was reproduction documentation that you could buy to put on your box at home for a display case or something. I haven't been able to find a reference from Colt itself. The documentation I put earlier in the video was from Colt that just said powder and ball. However, why not try it? So for this test, we've got powder, wad, ball, same percussion caps. Once again, we'll fire the first round. No problem. Here comes the rain again. I shake it. Second shot. Nope. Third. Nope. 
Fourth. Fifth. Nope. Sixth. So we got a few shots off. Feels like the cap isn't detonating, which is interesting, which would have nothing to do with the wadding or not. Here we go, another strike. Nope. All right, was able to double strike that and get that one to go off. Here's another one. Nope. It's like the cap isn't going off. I don't think the wad has anything to do with this whatsoever. I'm gonna guess at this point that the star just has a longer hammer throw and is therefore imparting more force and dealing with whatever's in the way causing the problem. Huh, it's interesting. Nope. No. All right, why don't we reload the star one more time because that seems to be the star of the show. Not gonna bother with the wad. And we'll see if that one does better than the Colt. This is a really fascinating result. Guess what, I think I'm onto something. When I pulled the cap off that didn't detonate on the star, you can see that part of the percussive material that would be your primer kind of got wet and then went down into the cone. So it's not failing from the front. It's failing from the rear. Hmm. I know these percussion caps are designed specifically to fit these cones, and so it's, they're a nice tight fit. They really are. But the failure is from the back. And as we see so often here on InRange, the second line gun is doing better than the most popular one. Huh. Let's go ahead and fire one just to make sure we're working. And here comes the rain again. Put a pointer sort of down. All right, a little less that time. Let's see what happens. Second shot. Third shot. Fourth shot. Fifth shot. Sixth shot. Not great. Let's go ahead and double strike some of these. Yep, that's it. All right, so I'm not sure what to say about this. I'm actually surprised by this result. I expected that these to do a lot better. Clearly a lot better than a flintlock, but certainly very susceptible to the rain. And that was just pouring rain from above down on it. Nothing like from above. So you really have to be careful about your weapon condition using a percussion revolver or percussion weapon for that matter. So those holsters were extremely important and probably you could do something like cover it like this until you were ready to fire. I don't know. I'm wondering what the tricks of the day were, but misfires in the rain appear to be a very common result, whether it was the 1860 Colt or the Star, even though the Star seemed to do a little better. The reality is neither was overwhelmingly successful. And this is justification, of course, for the movement to cartridges, which would absolutely work in these conditions. This would not affect a cartridge gun whatsoever. Uh, guys, I hope you enjoy this kind of content coming out here. This was actually tough today. Uh, these roads out here are thrashed from the rain. My area is messed up. And on top of that, of course, I have to go clean all these because they're going to start, actually are already starting to rust. Uh, but I've never seen anyone do anything like this, and I haven't read anything that wasn't seemingly apocryphal. And I wanted to find out myself, and hopefully you in the audience learned something, because I did. I expected a very different result, and that's always a cool result when you do a test like this. For those of you out there that really love InRange, please can support it, consider supporting me on Patreon. InRange is completely demonetized. No advertisers, no sponsors, no overlords. Uh, no one from any reproduction company sponsored this video, that's for sure. This is just my work, and funded completely by you, the viewer. You can find us at patreon.com slash InRangeTV. If you already are, thank you. Uh, if you'd like to consider it, find us there. If you can't, I do understand. The other thing you can really help with is fighting the algorithm. The algorithm has pretty much shadow banned this channel, is what it is. So if you share my video uh, organically, you can somewhat help defeat that algorithm and help us fight against the corporate oligarchy of the internet. Uh, and of course, like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. All right, just for funsies, I cleaned off the pan of the flintlock. I'm going to reprime it to see if it'll fire now. I haven't done anything to reload or anything like that. And uh, so this is just a clean, fresh priming charge. Maybe it'll fire. <laughs> Poof, fizzle. So obviously water got to the primary charge. Fired, but probably lost a lot of power. Just a fun thought experiment.